being under God and over the people. Now today, as you'll see in your handouts when they're printed and distributed, uh, we'll be looking at the doctrine of two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. Now, uh, we, we could have placed this class earlier in the lineup because it is so fundamental to our understanding of uh, Christians and the way that we relate to civil government, the way that we live out our lives, uh, fulfilling this cultural mandate. Um, but here it is early on in this 12-week course uh, for that very reason. Hopefully you are familiar with some of the concepts of which we speak today, if not uh, even the terms and the phrases specifically that we use. But before we go further, we should uh, go ahead and open our time with a word of prayer. So please pray with me as we seek God's blessing on our time. Our Father God, we thank you for your wisdom in ordaining and ordering all things in just the way that you have. We, we look to you now, Lord, this morning, and we ask for your Spirit to give us wisdom as we seek to discern your truth from your Word, from the pages of church history, and, and apply that to our lives. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who rules over all things. Amen. How should we as Christians live in an unchristian world? That's the question that Christians have uh, wrestled with uh, ever since the days of Jesus and his disciples. In fact, I think as we'll see this morning, it was even a question that the Old Testament saints uh, had to work through in their lives as well. We could ask the question another way. How is the church to live in the world? Even there in that question, how is the church to live in the world? We have two categories, two arenas of life already, don't we? I think it's pretty hard um, not to, to see those two things. Are, are the church and the world definitionally the same? No, thank you. Right answer. Certainly not. And that's what we're focused on this morning, is understanding better the distinction between the church and everything else. As we'll see this morning, there is no Berlin Wall kind of separation between the church and the world because we as believers are the church in the world. Uh, we've, we've always been that and we will be the church in the world until Christ comes again. As we've seen already, Christ Jesus is the supreme ruler over all things. Uh, this isn't contested by the various schools of thought that are out there regarding uh, Christians and culture or government. Jesus Christ is king over all, and I think we can all say amen to that. I don't think any group of believers argues that. Jesus is, is king of kings and lord of lords, period. But here's a question that needs to be asked pretty much immediately after a statement like that, that Jesus rules over all. How? How does Jesus rule over all things? And does he rule differently over different people? What does Scripture teach us? And so we have some work to do this morning, don't we? And by the way, we're not going to answer all of the questions this morning. Uh, as I was thinking about it and working on it this week, uh, Two Kingdoms, the doctrine itself, uh, has many vast implications and outcroppings and things that we could explore, but I'm going to do our best to hit on some of the high notes this morning and then probably allude to it in future classes. Uh, David Van Drunen has some helpful books on this topic, and I do lean heavily on him. Uh, one of them is, is this one, Living in God's Two Kingdoms. He's a professor out, out at uh, Westminster Seminary, California. And uh, he has a more recent book called Politics After Christendom. And he begins chapter one of that book with this sentence. Political theology is complex and controversial, and it is not at all obvious where to start. <laughs> okay, that's encouraging. That is certainly true. And uh, it's a good, I think, humble way to begin a discussion on a subject as vast and complicated as one on political theology, which is really the realm uh, which we're exploring through this series, the relationship between Christians and uh, the, the civil magistrate. 
Van Drunen divides that book, Politics After Christendom, into two simple parts. First part is political theology, and the second is political ethics. And so with this series at Grace Covenant, that's pretty much how we've sought to divide this class, is uh, to begin with the theology, to lay the foundational biblical principles at play in our thinking. Uh, We need to lay that solid foundation, establish a framework of sorts if we're going to hope to ever answer the question, how are we to go and live this out? We need to address the what's before the why's and how's, we could say. And answering the question of how we ought to live, well, that's a question of ethics. See, morals, those are the rules, those are the norm, and, and guiding principles for us. Ethics are the outworking of those uh, morals. Now, before we begin doing the work here of looking at Scripture and some definitions, um, w- you know, we do want to answer, if you just came in, our goal this morning is to answer the question, how should Christians live in an unchristian society? And I want to begin with some definitions and, and first look at some definitions or descriptions, more, more like, of some schools of thought that are not two kingdoms. Um, so first we'll look at one kingdom thinking. Uh, a one kingdom idea says there's no separation or maybe little separation between church and state. I should add at this point that there are degrees uh, of of thinking. Uh, There's kind of a spectrum even within each of these buckets or categories that we might think of. So this isn't a one-size-fits-all. Multiple, you know, nuances would would fall under probably each of these categories. But in general, a a one-kingdom ideology flattens or conflates uh, two kingdoms that we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Um, one of the earliest versions of this can be seen in the Roman Empire under Constantine. Constantine was the ruler of both the church, the Christian church, and the state, the, em- the empire of Rome, wasn't he? What are some other examples that you can think of in history of uh, a one kingdom ideology? What's that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Constantine was a Caesar. He was emperor of Rome. And so the Roman Empire is probably one of the earlier examples of that. That's good. What else? In, what's that? England. Exactly. So another approach here that, that combines the kingdoms or conflates them, confuses them is the Church of England. Yes, Ken? Hebrews? Like Old Testament Jews? Theocracy? Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, mostly. More, more like, yeah, uh, post uh, the cross. But yeah, no, that, there's, there's a lot. That's a, that's a rabbit hole that I don't know how far we're going to go down this morning. Islam. That is good. Yep, yep. Eastern Orthodoxy, sure, sure. Yeah, the Church of England is one that's probably... Uh, nearest to home in some ways for, for us. Um, you know, we can go back to, was it Henry VIII, who, who said conveniently, because he wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't grant it, that uh, he's going to now set himself up as the uh, leader of the church. And so he cut ties with the Pope of Rome, declared himself the leader of the Church of England. So that even to this day, Anglicanism uh, is a state church form of religion. Um, the, the head of the church, I believe, is the monarch of England. In the late 18th century, even, the English particular Baptist preacher Abraham Booth referred to the Church of England as, quote, manifestly a secular kingdom and, quote, a creature of the state. That's a, uh, one of our particular Baptist forefathers in the 1700s speaking about the Church of England, and he wasn't wrong. Uh, in fact, one, this one kingdom approach was actually embedded even into the English Presbyterian's Westminster Confession of Faith. One well-known uh, modern, ki- and we'll look at that more in a minute. One well-known modern one kingdom proponent would be someone like Dr. John Frame. I think he's down at uh, RTS Orlando now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, But Dr. Frame argues that the church and the state could both be holy. He calls the the state potentially holy if the uh, members of that state are themselves holy. Then by virtue of the membership, he says, uh, the the institution then becomes holy. 
I, I think what he's trying to say is that if everyone in America were a Christian, then we would have a, a church state. And um, I, I think that's still wrong, as we'll see further. But uh, he's confusing biblical categories. One kingdom thinking has produced some somewhat popular subsets of this view, such as ideas like transformationalism. And that's really where uh, someone like Dr. Frame uh, would, would align with a transformationalist kind of, of thinking. Or even um, something that's kind of had a resurgence in popularity, uh, surprisingly, in the last uh, decade or so, reconstructionism or theonomy. Uh, we'll look more at the idea of theonomy in a few weeks, so uh, be sure to come back for that one. But I do want to briefly address this idea of transformationalism. I remember being in college, and I was really into um, the arts, you know, movies and, and film and, and um, uh, theater and things like that. And so this idea of redeeming our culture really appealed to me. I remember I had a book called, I think it was called Redeeming Pop Culture. And um, the idea itself is to uh, redeem the culture by producing quality Christian art. And and in their minds, the transformationalists, part of the problem with society is that truth is missing in the artistic expressions of culture. So then we should go transform the culture by pointing people to God and his truth through the means of film and stories and whatever, emo-ish punk rock music or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that's a form of transformationalism. Every th- eventually, as I was looking at some of this, it, it just stopped making much sense, uh, especially with what I was hearing on Sundays with regards to the gospel. Uh, isn't that the way that we, that we will have any hope of transforming culture? As it begins with the gospel, God has ordained ordinarily for hearts to be changed by the preaching of his word and through the church. A a few years ago, too, I was in a business setting where I encountered a number of uh, business owners who were professing believers. And these men and women shared a desire to influence the communities around them uh, and help establish other Christian businesses. Uh, It sounded like a noble idea. Uh, This was like an incubator for Christian-owned businesses Unfortunately, however, what I noticed is that more and more uh, of these people who wanted to influence others for Jesus through these uh, secular means, I I don't know what to call them, um, they were in fact over time looking and sounding more like the people they were hoping to influence than the other way around. Um, I think Two Kingdoms, though, addresses this kind of approach by offering a biblical corrective, namely the gospel of Christ with the church of Christ and the ordinances of Christ front and center. Well, that's, that's one idea, uh, kind of a, a real brief overview of, of what a One Kingdom uh, doctrine could look like. Uh, a second polar opposite side of that would be a radical or a hyper two-kingdom doctrine. Uh, Just like with nearly any good idea, it can be taken too far uh, or distorted. I think we see that with this this hyper version of two kingdoms that basically goes from saying that there's a distinction between the common kingdom and redemptive kingdom to saying there's actually no this this hardcore separation between the two uh, kingdoms, and the two should, should ne'er in the middle meet. When we look back through history, I think we can identify the Anabaptists as a group of uh, people that would have held something like this, who put that solid wall between religion and state. Modern versions of this view show up in communities today like who? The Amish. How do you know, Paul? The Amish, he's, he's got some uh, experience with them uh, up in Carrie's uh, family's neck of the wood. Uh, modern views of this show up in communities like the Amish. Um, in these religious communities, things of the common kingdom are looked down upon. They're despised often as something uh, carnal. This would include everything from governments and militaries uh, to technology to banking to uh, public schooling, any involvement in that secular sphere. Uh, they would take the notion of not being of the world maybe too literally, too far, perhaps. But we need to understand that the world is, that, that we live in is a mixed place, isn't it? When Jesus told his disciples that my kingdom is not of this world, he was then and there establishing this principle, which is the foundation of what we call two kingdoms. Notice what Jesus didn't say, though. He didn't say, my kingdom is not of this world, so let's get out of here. <laughs> 
He, he didn't say, okay, guys, uh, get close to me. I'm going to beam us all up to heaven now because my kingdom is not of this world. So let's go. No, he didn't do that. He came to fulfill the work of his father that, that God had sent him to do, that Adam had failed to do, as we'll see more, and then to establish a church here on earth to live and grow by the power of his spirit, which he also left. Our dear friend and, and uh, former pastor who's gone to be with the Lord a, a few years ago, Ron Baines, he said it like this, God governs two kingdoms. He governs the church as redeemer in Christ through its institutions on this planet, the redeemed community. And he governs his creation as creator, the kingdoms of this world through common grace, his goodness to them. And he goes on and says, and they are both good. Uh, the Amish need to hear that. <laughs> that this, this kingdom of, of this world that Christ is ruler over uh, is a good kingdom in that sense. The difference is that one is eternal, Bain says, and one is temporal, end quote. I'm going to be editing on the fly this morning because I have about two and a half hours of material to get into, you know, uh, 40 minutes. Um, Okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and look specifically at this idea we call two kingdoms. Uh, some have, have referred to it, often referred to it as two kingdoms theology. Uh, however, I'm with Dr. David Van Drunen, who makes the point that two kingdoms is not so much a theology. A theology is more of a system of, of our approach to uh, the doctrines of Scripture. It's, it's less a system of theology and more of an outworking of the various systems of theology that are already in place. Uh, it's a doctrine that lives and operates within the various theological methods for doctrine itself. For example, um, we could explore, if time permitted us, to see how the doctrine of two kingdoms is rooted in our understanding of protology. Uh, what is protology? The study of first things, right? Right? We could go back to the beginning and look at how God created and consider how that created order applies to this doctrine. And we'll see some of that this morning. A two kingdoms is rooted in our biblical theology. We see God's plan of redemption unfolding through the Bible's narrative. When Adam failed to fulfill the uh, cultural mandate that God gave him, God, by his grace, promised another son of man who would fulfill that cultural mandate ultimately. We could, we could see uh, two kingdoms as a doctrine showing up in our covenant theology. And we'll look at the covenantal framework for this doctrine this morning. We could even see how it shows up in our anthropology, that is, the study of the doctrine of man. Uh, we consider, again, the first Adam and his role given to him by God in the garden. Uh, we, could, we could see it in our political theology and our political ethics. And then, of course, ultimately, we see two kingdoms in our eschatology, don't we? That is in our understanding of the last and the ultimate things. This doctrine has some weight when we come to that study. As Christians, here, here we come to a description of two kingdoms. We live in these two spheres, as it's been said. What are these two kingdoms? Uh, if you've got your hand out, uh, you can kind of see various ways that, that they've been referred to by people throughout history. Augustine referred to these two kingdoms uh, in, in a different way. Again, all of these have nuances depending on who is explaining these doctrines. Um, in Augustine's day, or even in Luther and Calvin's day, the doctrine that we're discussing today would have taken uh, different, uh, slightly different shapes, uh, different coloring. So um, it's, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not this consistent thought that's just been there ever since, you know, Adam was in the garden. No, it's developed as much of our uh, theo theological, biblical understanding has developed. It's developed over the years. But still, we see this uh, even in Augustine. He was writing shortly after the fall of Rome about the city of God and comparing it to this city of man. Um, we could refer to the two kingdoms almost uh, as earth and heaven. We could think of it in terms of the physical order of creation as well as the spiritual order of new creation. There's a common kingdom that is for all people and all people are a part of that kingdom of creation. And there's then this less common, more exclusive kingdom that we might call the redemptive kingdom. 
We're all born into the same common kingdom, and yet the spiritual kingdom is only made up of those who've been born into it, not by physical generation, but by spiritual generation, or what we call, in theological terms, regeneration. We are citizens, though, of both kingdoms. The earthly kingdom of this world by virtue of our physical birth, and the heavenly kingdom of this world by virtue of our second birth, if we are in Christ. Maybe you've heard of that already, not yet paradigm. Have you heard of that? We have the spiritual blessing of heaven granted to us now already by the Spirit of Christ. And still, we have not yet gone to be there to fully grasp the tangible riches of His glory and grace given. Uh, We could say about the common kingdom that this is a sin-cursed kingdom. Ultimately, it's ruled by God by way of his covenant, but his covenant with Noah according to his moral laws as revealed by nature. We've learned through previous studies uh, here in adult Sunday school uh, about God's revealing of his law through nature. We call it natural law, the imprint of God's moral law upon the heart of man at conception. This kingdom, this common kingdom, encompasses all humanity. And as the supreme ruler of this kingdom, God ensures that he preserves it until the day of judgment. When, at that point, what will God do with the common kingdom? He will destroy it and establish a new creation. Now, sometimes there's a caricature painted of two kingdoms by its opponents, which says that this doctrine doesn't put Jesus Christ on the throne over all things. But I hope that if you've been to a few of our classes so far, that you would uh, easily be, be able to say, no, that's not, that's not true. That's not what we're teaching. What was the first class in our study here? That Jesus Christ is the supreme ruler over all things. It's not like he rules over his spiritual kingdom, the church, and then leaves the rest to someone else, the the governments of the earth, or maybe Satan himself. That's not what two kingdoms is saying. God, as our confession properly puts it, is the supreme Lord and King of all the world. Uh, We know that there's not one centimeter of creation that does not submit to the rule of God. Colossians 1 puts this quite clearly for us, speaking of Christ the King. But listen here to the way, the the dual rule of Christ uh, that it speaks of here in Colossians 1. He, Paul says, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. <clears throat> and he is the head of the body, the what? The church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Is there room in in any of Paul's theological language here for Christ not to be ruler over something? No. Christ is ruler over all things, both the created order of which he is the firstborn and the creator himself and the sustainer himself, as well as the head of the body, the church. We see just even there, and explaining this and reading this out loud, we, we hear the, the dual nature of Christ's rule over all things. So we say as Christians uh, that we possess a dual citizenship because, again, we are, we are in the common kingdom and we are in the spiritual kingdom if we are Christians. And that's a biblical idea and we have certain responsibilities in both arenas of our Lives. Here's how Dr. Michael Horton, another Westminster Seminary, uh, California professor, how he explained this. Christians, he said, have two callings. The high calling in Christ to belong to his body and the calling to the world as citizens, parents, children, friends, co-workers, and neighbors. Because God is still faithful to his creation, there is the possibility of an earthly city with its relative peace and justice. Because God is faithful to his electing purposes, 
There is a church in all times and places that brings true peace and justice. He does this, first of all, by uniting sinners to Christ. Isn't that what Colossians 1 ends with there? Uh, what, what we just read. Making peace by the blood of his cross. That's an atoning work of Christ, uniting sinners to him. And then one day, uh, Horton says, by eradicating all strife from the earth. When is that one day? Horton says it, at Christ's return. Any questions so far? Okay. So we are looking at these two distinct spheres in which we live. Spheres which are both ultimately good because they're created and governed by Christ. But the way in which he governs each is different. And this goes back to our question of how. We can all agree as Christians that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's a straw man when I hear theonomists say that we as two kingdom proponents don't believe that or we don't apply that in our political theology. We do believe that, but we distinguish. You ever heard that before in, in theology? We distinguish. Christ's government over the common kingdom or the sphere of creation is mediated. I mean, is Christ sitting, on, on, is Christ sitting right now in the Oval Office? No. It's mediated, isn't it? His authority. We've already seen this in, in class one, I think mediated through uh, man-made laws and earthly governments. And yet Christ is still supreme ruler and king over all. His redemptive kingdom or the church is likewise mediated, isn't it? It's mediated by his own instructions for it, but through the, uh, the, the elders of the church and the congregation of churches which have this uh, mutual uh, sense of authority in working together with these keys of Christ's kingdom. As early American Baptist preacher Isaac Backus put it, um, it is evident to us, he said, that God always claimed it as his sole prerogative to determine by his own laws what his worship shall be, who shall minister in it, and how they shall be supported. In other words, Backus is saying, keep the state out of our worship. God designed the church and governs the church in, in its worship. And it's by his sole prerogative, Bacchus says, to determine how his churches shall function. And thankfully, thankfully, we still have a worship service today in America that is mostly free from most hindrances or impeding regulations by the government of man. Not every um, culture, every church and every culture in the world can say that. It's important to note, though, that when we speak about this doctrine of two kingdoms, we're not referring to two spheres of life that are absolutely separate from one another. Again, that's, that's a, a radical view of this doctrine. No, the common kingdom and the redemptive kingdom in this epoch are not completely separate, or, but, but they are distinct. So we can distinguish them, we can see them separately, and yet they're not separate. Uh, the, the image on this might be helpful. It, it brings up its own questions, but it could be helpful with this, uh, what, concentric circles? Is that what we call it? Overlapping circles. Venn diagram, that too. Very good, thank you. All right, so let's, let's move on to the creation mandate. And for the sake of time, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, skip most of this because we, we have already talked about uh, the creation mandate when we talked about how God had uh, designed a purpose for government. When? After, after Adam messed everything up, and he's like, okay, we're going to come up with a government then. No, before that, even in, in the garden, he gave Adam a, a structure and work to do. He gave him a cultural mandate, as it's been said, to subdue the earth, uh, produce more uh, little Adams and Eves, uh, to then help with the work of subduing the earth and taking dominion and expanding and governing creation. Expanding the borders of, of Eden and, and keeping everything, you know, all good. But, as we know, Adam failed in that work because he disobeyed God. Which brings us to our covenantal framework for understanding two kingdoms doctrine. Uh, I should pause here and say that different people who all might affirm a, a similar version of two kingdom doctrine arrive, can arrive at their conclusions through different premises. Okay, so not all those who say, yeah, I, I'm a proponent of two kingdoms, or reformed two kingdoms, as it's sometimes called, uh, likewise say, 
what we're going to look at here with regards to this covenantal framework for a two kingdom doctrine. But we are covenantal Baptists and, and we're going to look at this in this way and I think it helps. Um, Brandon Adams is, is one brother who's, who's written on a number of topics dealing with uh, political theology and uh, covenant theology. And he says this, the difference between the two perspectives, lar- uh, meaning like a, like a mono-covenantal or, or one kingdom approach versus a two kingdom, the difference between the two perspectives is, he says, largely a difference in understanding covenant theology. So there it is. Adams goes on to write, one side correctly understands that Adam was placed in a covenant of works, which we talked about a, a month or two ago in our study through covenant theology. Adam was placed in a covenant of works wherein his perfect obedience to the law would have earned him the reward of an immutable, thus eternal life. Uh, this covenant included obedience to his task of exercising dominion in the garden and out into the whole world. Thus, we could say that Adam was laboring in this age for the reward of the age to come, that that eternal Sabbath rest. Adam fell, though, and broke the covenant of works, but God did not immediately commence the final judgment. He delayed it for the sake of the glorification of Christ and the redemption of his bride. So Adam and all those in Adam were cursed and lost any hope of earning the reward of the age to come, but they continued to exist in this age. Thus, this age was modified, Brandon Adams says, by the fall to remove any possibility of reward for labor in this age. At this point, labor was merely to survive. We have to work the ground in order to produce fruit to eat and, and survive. Now, now, this modification that he mentions, uh, it, it leads us to another covenant that would follow the covenant of works that God made with Adam. And what is that other covenant that we come to here in Genesis? Genesis 9. Does anyone know? The Noahic Covenant. Here we see many of the same elements of the creation mandate. If you turn to Genesis 9, read the first, uh, what is it, like seven, uh, nine verses, maybe more than that. Uh, we, We see that God is giving many of the same instructions to Noah, uh, but, but not all the same and, and different. He's giving these instructions to Noah now refracted through the lens of, of what's happened in the fall with Adam. And, it, and he's giving them to not a, a perfect garden sanctuary to a, a, a sinless person, but to a sinful, fallen, broken world. This is where guys like Van Drunen really build their doctrine of the common kingdom from Genesis 9 and the Noahic covenant. Uh, Once more, here's Brandon Adams with a helpful description of the Noahic covenant. Uh, And and fair warning here, uh, there's a number of quotes here in this section because these guys are way smarter than me and say it much better than I could. So Brandon Adams, helpful description of the Noahic Covenant. He says, The Noahic Covenant was a formal arrangement to stabilize the modified present age. Uh, Its purpose was the common preservation of of the world, this age, until the last elect is redeemed and Christ returns the age to come. Do you, do you hear, though, how, how Adams is actually already connecting the dots between our doctrine of two kingdoms and our eschatology and talking about this age and the age to come? You'll hear that a lot. The age to come exists in the form of the already not yet, and the gospel, as the gospel is proclaimed and hearts are regenerated, the age to come breaks into this age already. And so there's that overlap. The age to come, the kingdom of heaven, as Christ would proclaim, has already broken into this current age. And so we have the overlap of these spheres. The kingdom the saints inherit, Adam says, is not this age or world. That's not our inheritance, but rather the new heavens and the new earth, the age to come that Adam was laboring to enter before the fall. Thus, he says, we are pilgrims here, suffering in this age while we await our full redemption in the age to come. Does that sound, does that sound biblical? Does that sound New Testament to anyone? I hear it. We, we finished First Peter, uh, what was that, a year ago or so? And, and, and that's, that's First Peter. And we'll get to that more in a minute. Van Drunen picks up on this and he says, several important features characterize this common kingdom established by the Noahic covenant. It concerns ordinary cultural activities rather than special acts of worship or religious devotion. Okay, so there's a distinction made there. The ordinary versus the special. Uh, the, the cultural activities versus the church activities, we could say. It embraces the human race in common, 
rather than a holy people that are distinguished from the rest of the human race. It ensures the preservation of the natural and social order rather than, he says, the redemption of this order. And it is established temporarily rather than permanently. Are you hearing the distinction between these two spheres, these two kingdoms? Sam Renahan, in his excellent work, The Mystery of Christ, His Covenant, and His Kingdom, he can't not address this, right? Uh, He says this, Noah and mankind are called to build and cultivate and expand and construct and establish human civilization. They are to take advantage, he says, in in the best sense of the phrase, of the natural world around them. This is a cultural mandate as part of the covenant ruling a kingdom, the Noahic covenant. And it applies to all men equally. Everyone must take this seriously. God rules his kingdoms, Renahan says, through covenant. We belong to the kingdom of creation. Thus, we are accountable to this covenant. We are part of mankind and whom God made this, with whom God made this covenant. And this commission applies to mankind today as it did in the days of Noah. Federal headship reaches to all generations so long as the covenant remains active. So then, all mankind is called to raise up and establish structured and successful societies pursuing cultural achievements and growth. That's our calling as mankind within the common kingdom. Jacob. Mm-hmm. That- Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is, that's a great question. This is very similar to what we see in, uh, with, with exilic uh, 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 Israel, you know, God's people in exile after the fall. And we'll look at that more under our Old Testament proofs, um, that they, are, they still have the Noahic coven- covenant governing, as we do today, uh, our instructions for how we ought to live and carry out this, this cultural mandate that God gave to and through Noah. Any other questions or comments there? All right, so Van Drunen then contrasts this and, and explains, describes the redemptive kingdom established by the Abrahamic covenant. And he says this, it concerns religious faith and worship rather than ordinary cultural activities. He's saying basically the exact opposite about the redemptive kingdom. It embraces a holy people that is, that is distinguished from the rest of the human race, rather than the whole human race in common. It bestows the benefits of salvation upon this holy people, rather than preserving the natural and social order, and it is established forever and ever. He says finally, Van Drunen, God is redeeming a people for himself by virtue of the covenant, made with Abraham and brought to glorious fulfillment in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has completed Adam's original task once and for all. And if we don't get to it, I think Hebrews 2 is a wonderful proof for that last statement that Van Drunen made. Okay, any questions before we move on to some of the Old and New Testament proofs or examples of uh, a, a two-kingdom doctrine? Yeah, Seth. Oh, yeah, that, so that would have been um, Augustine's, yeah, uh, the question was, can, can I elaborate on the city of God on the handout and the city of man on both sides? So uh, that would have simply been Augustine's early way of uh, describing um, the, the two kingdoms, these two spheres. And, you know, there would be things that we read in him that we would say, okay, that's not exactly what we're talking about uh, today in the same way, just like Calvin uh, had, had a conflation of, of parts of this doctrine in some ways during his day with regards to the civil magistrate. But that would have been um, one way that you might hear people describe uh, this idea of, yeah, we, we do have these two uh, spheres of, of obligation in, in, in our lives as Christians and, and uh, common kingdom members. Okay, good question. So, uh, Old Testament proofs. You know, one of the, one of the criticisms of this uh, two-kingdom view is espoused, especially by those like the Westminster California guys, uh, has been that the doctrine is not clearly found through the majority of the narrative of the Old Testament. And, um, and, and it does get confusing when we start to talk about the theocracy. But I think what we see is the doctrine of two kingdoms as connected to the covenantal framework of Scripture. When we, when we see that connection, we can see that the doctrine itself unfolds over time 
along with the covenants throughout redemptive history. So in earlier redemptive history, the doctrines of two kingdoms, it was present there as early as uh, Genesis 1 and then Genesis 9. But it was perhaps less evident in the writings of the original text. And when Moses is writing uh, under this theocratic rule, um, there, there wasn't a huge reason to emphasize this because you had God uh, as the supreme Lord of both the church and the state, and yet he still mediated uh, through uh, men and leaders. Um, so it's not quite as obvious in some portions of Scripture as it is in the later portions of Scripture. But I think that Scripture does interpret Scripture, the new interpreting the old, to show us that even the patriarchs have this understanding of, of this world not being their home. If we turn to Hebrews 11, for example, it says it more than once regarding Abraham and Sarah in, in verses 8 through 10, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And so you have this, uh, this twofold aspect of these covenants early on that God made with uh, Abraham and, and uh, through David, where there, there was this already not yet fulfillment to each of the covenants. This aspect of a, uh, a physical inheritance as well as a spiritual inheritance, which points us in that direction of a, a two-kingdom, two-sphere uh, doctrine. Oh, there's so much more that could be said there, but... Um, all right, if we had more time, I would love to look more at uh, some of the two kingdom uh, living, those like Joseph, who honored God as the prime minister of, raised up by God as a prime minister, essentially, of Egypt um, in a pagan land and culture and worked for the glory of God in the role that God placed him. And that by itself, that, that example of Joseph uh, would... Um, probably be a, a, a argument against the radical version of, of two kingdom. Um, we could look at Daniel similarly and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, and, and how they fulfilled their obligations, both their primary spiritual obligations to God as citizens of the spiritual redemptive kingdom of God as well as their obligations to man to the best of their ability when it didn't call them to compromise their other obligations and, and sin against God. John. Okay, thank you so much for that. I'll give you my notes and you can do it, but um, I appreciate that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so uh, similarly, I think we could look at Esther and her uncle Mordecai and, and maybe see some of that in their exilic uh, context. Yes, Paul? Uh, that was a typo. Yes, thank you. That was really your question. Could you elaborate on this typo? <clears throat> I didn't want to call it. Nah, thank you. Leave it to my brother to do that. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Let's look at some New Testament proofs for this, this understanding of, of two kingdoms. I think uh, the most fo straightforward proof is... Um, uh, for the doctrine of two kingdoms actually comes from the mouth of, of Jesus himself. Uh, probably the most famous is found there in John 18, 36, when Jesus is standing before Pilate uh, just prior to his, his crucifixion and being delivered to the Jews to be killed. And Jesus speaks to the governor and says this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, what would be happening? All my, all my guys would be up in arms. All my servants would have been fighting, he says, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But he had already instructed them quite well. Or they were cowards, or both. Yeah, the disciples of Christ. Stephen? I think we'll get to this point too. I think some of these guys that have more than God might be That's right. 
That's right. So Stephen said that uh, this is a good proof text uh, against some of the uh, arguments of theonomy that want to point to this and, and connect it to the Great Commission. Yeah. And, and um, there's much more to it here. We, we see Christ saying both my kingdom is not of this world, um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not also king of this world. And as Pilate says, I think in the next sentence, so you're saying you're a king. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, over everything. Um, but my kingdom is not of this world, he says. Embedded in this statement is this reality of, of the two kingdoms. He's standing, I mean, I mean, just the visual. He's standing there within the boundaries of the Roman Empire, in a, in a courtroom, in a, a, a governor's chambers uh, of, of a human authority, and at the same time acknowledging to that legitimate Roman ruler, of whom he is also the supreme ruler, that he was a king of his own distinct non-worldly kingdom, as well as this one. Abraham Booth, in an essay on the kingdom of Christ, quite simply puts it like this, the empire of Christ, and I love that term, the empire of Christ. It's not just Caesar's empire. All creation, all the universe is the empire of Christ. He says, is not of this world. It is not a temporal, but a spiritual kingdom. Jesus says to his disciples uh, in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you're not of the world. <laughs> That's why the world hates you. I chose you out of the world, he says, and, and that's why the world hates you. In John 17, 14 through 16, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Notice that. He, he's using world in different senses here, isn't he? We distinguish. But that you keep them from the evil one while they're in this world, but also not of this world. He's saying two things at the same time in different ways, and they're both true. If Christ's disciples are not of this world, then what are they of? They're of the kingdom of God. All throughout the, the Gospels, Jesus is speaking of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, the kingdom that's to come. He's referring to that spiritual, redemptive sphere of his authority to, of those he would purchase with his blood. Uh, listen, listen again to Colossians uh, chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain, the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I get that Paul is talking in spiritual terms here with regards to the domain and the kingdom, but that's just the thing. When Paul and even Christ himself through Matthew and the other gospels speaks of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Christ the Son, he's speaking in spiritual terms. And remember how difficult this was for so many of the Jews to get they kept waiting for him. If you're really a king, then, you know, and, and they, they waved palm branches and they, they got so excited about the coming king. Yes, Ken. Yeah. Absolutely. It is a spiritual battle, battle that we're involved with, and that's what he's teaching here. Um, Again, Booth, he quotes a Dutch theologian named Ventringa. Uh, Brand has probably read Ventringa, huh? I don't know. I never heard of him. But he writes this. The kingdom of grace in which Christ is king upon Mount Zion is properly and emphatically the kingdom of Christ, of which none are his subjects except those who are chosen, called, faithful, peaceable, and humble, in whom Jesus Christ lives by his spirit as in the members of a mystical and spiritual body of which he is the head. What's that sound like? The church. Matthew 16, that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. Uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, he, he's given the keys of the kingdom to the church. He didn't give the keys of the kingdom to the civil government. So already, just there, Christ has distinguished between two rules, two authorities in this world. Um, so much more could be said on these, um, these aspects. And there are many more uh, New Testament proofs. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and, and we hear the, the carryover from uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament of this exilic language. And Peter addresses his, his audience as sojourners and exiles. Um, those who are elect exiles. Um, Hebrews 12.28, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Just a few verses later, for here we have no lasting city. Remember, it's a temporal one, the city of man. But we seek the city that is to come. All right, let me just take five seconds to figure out what I'm skipping. <laughs> 
Right, any questions before we uh, get close to wrapping up? Yes? I believe so. Right. Sure. Yeah, good point. You can switch kingdoms from darkness to light while staying in the common kingdom. Good. So we've become three kingdom uh, theologians this morning. No, that's that's a that's a good uh, uh, clarification. Thank you. Yeah, Hebrews, Hebrews 2 verse 8 kind of gets in, and I think Van Drunen really um, hammers on this. Uh, it might be Van Drunen, it might be someone else. Um, basically pointing us to the fact that Christ is, is the better Adam. He is the uh, one who has fulfilled the task that Adam failed to fulfill. And um, Hebrews 2 is saying that it's fitting, it makes sense that Jesus Christ, uh, who is the same one who uh, made all things and sustains all things, should also be the one who redeems all things. And so um, that's, that's why the second person of the Trinity assumed uh, human flesh to redeem what Adam lost back to God. Uh, both in the spiritual order as well as in the created order. And when we think about that, that means that we don't have to. That means that we don't have to not only merit what Christ has already merited for us spiritually, but we don't have to redeem what Christ has promised to redeem physically. Does that make sense? In the created common sphere. Pastor Rob. It does. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the redemption of creation happens at the consummation, not during the time of wandering. Well said. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to mostly skip over the historical teachings here. Um, I didn't have a whole lot there anyway, other than to just kind of trace uh, uh, some of these guys throughout history and how they dealt with it. Um, I'll, I'll say this, though, for our purposes here. Um, the New England Baptist pastor, Isaac Backus, again, he wrote once more on the subject of two kingdoms in his day. And uh, just as a simple example, here's one quote in his book, An Appeal to the Public for Religious Liberty Against the Oppressions of the Present Day. He says this, all acts of executive power in the civil state are to be performed in the name of the king or state they belong to, while all our religious acts are to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, and so are to be, be performed heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. He's distinguishing, and that's just one small excerpt from his larger work uh, distinguishing between these two spheres. But uh, essentially, I, what, are the, what I appreciate about guys like Bacchus, and, and there were plenty of others, but I don't know that, and, and Professor, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any other uh, government, human government, established in the world until the establishment of the American colonies that was built upon this understanding of the doctrine of two kingdoms, a separation or a distinction between the church spiritually and the state magisterially. Maybe some examples. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but that's but but that's my point. Is guys, the Baptist got it right. And, and, and they had the strongest uh, view on this. And the, uh, you know, I'm quoting from Baptist here with Abraham Booth um, and, and others. Um, yes, Russ? Would, would this not be the group referred to as Sure, yeah. He, he, was, he would have been a dissenter, but, but he was also a, a particular Baptist. So, so yeah, they, they would have separated from that, um, that state church rule. Yeah, and one of the religious liberties that they ended up establishing here in, in the, the New World. Awesome. We are, actually. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and by we, I mean you. Um, 
Okay, pastoral implications here. Um, as, as we close out our time this, this morning, I, I just wanted to mention some, some practical and what I call them on the sheet here, pastoral implications uh, to this doctrine. I, I call it pastoral because I believe that uh, pastors and churches really do wrestle with this doctrine on a regular basis. Now, whether we realize it or put it into that framework or not, uh, I, I think it, it does come to the surface. Uh, one way is, is in the scope of our obligations. Uh, whose job is it to do what? That's, that's always a good question. Um, when we have categories like a common kingdom and spiritual kingdom, like state and church, we already have this framework by which we can understand our obligations and our duties within each sphere, what's required of us in each part of our lives. And when we apply that, we would argue that there are spiritual duties that were called by God to perform within the context of the church that are different from other duties uh, we might have in other arenas of our lives. And likewise, um, it limits to what Christians can do outside the context of the church. For example, it's not our job as the church to redeem the culture. I think we've kind of already hit on this. But one kingdom proponents and transformationalists want to see that. We aren't that looking to transform society in, into a Christian society around us. This means it's not the church's do- job to get Christians elected into office. It's not the church's job to get bills passed. It's not the church's job to influence businesses or the world of sports and entertainment. It's certainly not the church's job to transform culture by coercion or force. My friends, you can't find Jesus or his disciples or the early church teaching anything along these lines. As those who have descended from Adam, we share in his God-given obligations of exercising dominion over God's creation. And as those who've been born again of the second Adam, we are simply called to pattern our lives after him, resting in Christ by faith and seeking to obey his laws out of love and gratitude. So, um, it scopes our obligations, this doctrine of two kingdoms. Secondly, it, it helps inform our political engagement. Um, we need to be reminded that this broken world, our, our hope is not rooted here in the things of this world. We need to remember that in our cultural engagement, our political engagement. Um, Carl Truman writes this. Let me quote him real quick in his eyebrow-raising book called Republocrat. Um, He writes this in his concluding thoughts. It is simply not the church's job to parse political issues. Sure, there are basic elements to Christian ethics, respect for life, honesty, care for the poor, etc. And in preaching the gospel week by week, the church shapes the minds and the ethics of her people. But how these things manifest themselves at the level of political policy is something with which Christians, as members of civic society, or we could say common kingdom, have to wrestle with and over which they can legitimately disagree. Hmm. The danger, he says, in taking strong political positions on these issues, and even worse, partisan politics, is that the church will ultimately exclude those who do indeed believe the gospel and should therefore be included. As Christians, we should be able to disagree vigorously on, say, gun control. Don't shoot me. We should, if you like, be able to stand on opposite sides of the protest lines on such issues Monday to Saturday and yet come together to take the Lord's Supper on Sundays as Christian brothers and sisters united by a common faith even as we are divided by our strongly held politics. Amen. And finally, almost finally, cautions, uh, fear and hope. Uh, read Psalm 119, 52 through 54. Great, great text. Psalm 119, 52 through 54. Uh, we... we we must not fear. We can and should have hope in Christ and his faithful provision for his sheep and the certainty that he will come again and make all things new. And finally, we don't want to put too strong of a separation between church and state. Uh, to answer the question we started with, how should we as Christians live in an unchristian world? We live as those who are citizens of two kingdoms, both of which are ruled by Christ. This world is not our home, and yet here we are. We live in two overlapping kingdoms right now, and as we do, may the Lord grant us much grace and wisdom to live for his glory. All right, thank you guys for bearing with me this morning. Let's go ahead and close in prayer before we uh, head to a time of fellowship and worship. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you again for your word, which informs our thoughts and our actions. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as we seek to live uh, holy lives before you and righteous lives before men in both these spheres that you've placed us. We ask all of this and ask for your help.